armor in Elite Dangerous is a little obtuse. There's not a lot of in-game documentation that explains how this works, so I thought it'd be useful to make a, a shorter video trying to just quickly go over some of the dynamics that go into armor reinforcement. Now, I'm going to do a separate video about shields, so we'll clear this out for now, and we'll just worry about armor, since this is going to form the base integrity of your ship, and even if you're opting to build a shield tank, you do need to give some consideration to the way your hull is going to react to incoming damage. Now, in Elite Dangerous, <coughs> every ship's hull has a set of fixed factors that you have to take into account. In the case of this Model Type 10 I'm using here, the base hull mass is 1,200 tons, which cannot be altered or changed in any way. And that hull is also going to come with another base value, which Coriolis reflects here, known as hull hardness, which you'll see is 75. These two values are important for different reasons. Hull mass or base hull mass affects your ship's weight and has an influence over how thrusters respond to, to pushing your ship around. But that's something that we will save for another day when we talk about how thrusters work on the different ships. Hull hardness is the important value we want to focus on right now. Every ship in Elite Dangerous has different hull hardness values. And they'll, uh, they get divided up in an interesting way, which I can actually show you here on the Elite Dangerous wiki. Hull hardness ratings vary from ship to ship. Now, there are usually uh, more than one ship in each, har in each armor class, with a couple of exceptions down here for some of the mediums and smalls. But the Type 10 Defender is the only ship in the game with a rating of 75, the highest possible rating that any uh, commander-controlled ship can possibly get for armor, with the Imperial Cutter, Federal Corvette, Fertilance, and Mamba coming in at 70. And that's actually something I actually want to point out, too, that the Imperial Cutter and Federal Corvette are large ships, while the Fertilance and Mamba are medium ships. So the larger the ship doesn't necessarily mean the harder the armor. There are some interesting exceptions to this rule. Sometimes a medium ship can have an incredible armor, and being aware of which medium ships do can give you an advantage when selecting stuff for combat. This rating of 70 is actually one of the big reasons why the Fertilance is a favorite among commanders, because even if its shields pop, that base armor rating gives you some resilience that, that you just can't get from any of the other mediums. The Mamba has this too. They're both Zorg and Peterson ships, so it kind of makes sense, but the Mamba handles like crap, and so even though it, it can theoretically give you comparable damage outputs compared to the Fertilance, nobody wants to fly it because it's a pain to steer. Uh, and then you get down here to a rating of 65, so that's your Type 9, the uh, Alliance series of ships, and the Anaconda, which is probably one of the best multi-role ships in the entire game, but it's it's just a little bit squishier than the core combat ships that you find up here with the base 70 rating. Uh, well, and there's the Imperial Cutter, which isn't actually, I wouldn't consider it a core combat ship, although it is more than capable of dishing out some punishment on demand when it needs to. It's setup is more clearly a uh, defensive bias with less raw damage output than the Corvette or even the Anaconda but an incredibly stiff shield that's hard to penetrate and then of course some kick-ass armor. The Anaconda and the Python uh, both have armor ratings of 65 which isn't bad, I mean, it's respectable. <coughs> And then as you you get down here into the, the liners, the Crate Phantom, the Orca, the Crate Mark II and the Crate Phantom actually have the same armor value. The difference there that, that they have is they have a higher base absolute hull value. Uh, the Type 7 Transporter, the Asp Explorer, you just keep, and as you get down into the smaller and smaller ships, you have a generally downwards facing trend. Uh, but you do get an interesting exceptions here and there. Um, the Hauler and the Sidewinder have the worst armor in the game. So if you're in a start winder and you like flying it, you just need to, to keep in mind that, that that weak hull is going to make you vulnerable and it's probably a good idea to emphasize shield strength because you're, you're going to have a hard time overcoming this since it's an intrinsic factor and no amount of engineering will ever change that value. Although some engineering effects can lower it depending on the weapon and we'll get to that here in a minute. So. Why does whole hardness matter? Well, if we go over here to the forums, there are a lot of players in this game who have poured over how all of this works. And what they get um, 
what they figured out is that the actual damage a weapon does is related to the piercing value of the weapon in question, which I'll show you here in a second, divided by the hole hardness, which I just went over, times the base damage of the weapon in question. What does that look like in practice? Well, we'll go over here to our model type 10 defender and I'll start throwing some weapons on here. Let's see. Since it's a big boy, we're going to use gimbals for our example because the piercing value actually doesn't change between different weapon archetypes. Let me just scroll down here to where the multicam. There it is. So we got this guy, we got I'll put a fixed multi cannon down here just so I can show you, but the piercing value is determined by the weapon type, in this case a multi cannon, and the hard point size. In this case a large hard point. But you'll see that that both the gimbaled and fixed variant just have a piercing value of fifty four. We'll go back over here and let me see actually if I can split my screen. What that means in practice is well, that's interesting. That looks like it might be a bug in the way Coriolis renders its pages. Let me just refresh it to see if I can get that to go. Oh no, it's just stacking the interface. Alright, let me scroll down here. Sorry, some of these nuances can throw me for a loop just a little bit. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Okay, so now we've actually shrunk this scale down so we can see what's going on. We've got a base piercing value of 54. That means that the multi-cannon, without any engineering, will do its maximum damage, assuming that you're firing at a target inside of its falloff range, of 18.9 damage per second. So how many ships in this game have a piercing value below 54? Well, the crate... The two crates, the Orca and the Vulture, actually come really close. You'll get a very minimal debuff to the weapon's DPS without any engineering modifiers. But anything, uh, basically from this point down, a size 3 multi-cannon is going to do its full damage to, without any engineering to, to, to modify or, or add or take away from it. Now, uh, resistances can actually affect how that works. We'll get into resistances here next. But uh, we're, for the moment, assuming no engineering at all. Um, if you have a large hardpoint, then that large hardpoint will be the best suited to attack these types of ships. It can attack everything north of that 54 threshold. There's nothing that stops you from doing that. But the higher that number gets above 54, the more of a debuff your weapon is going to take when attacking the hull of that ship before any engineering gets accounted for whatsoever. And actually this, this piercing debuff will get applied to engineering effects. So if you had this, these cannons were overcharged and did higher damage, this piercing differential would still apply unless you had something to alter the hardness of the target ship, which you can do with an engineering effect um, known as corrosive. So we'll actually apply that here overcharged increases the damage of a weapon and it's absolutely devastating on kinetics. I wouldn't advise it for energy weapons because of the distributor draw that it inflicts, but we go over here, corrosive shell. Coriolis doesn't explain what these effects are, it just gives you their raw stat changes. So, um, the reason why a lot of people will put corrosive shell on multi-cannons is, or on any kinetic that offers it, at least one time, on, well, only one time on their ship though, that's the nuance. Corrosive shell doesn't stack. But its basic effect is that it goes to the armor hardness of a particular ship and it lowers it. So, for example, if you were attacking something like a Beluga liner, any of the Federal dropships, any of the crates, and you hit them with corrosive shell, their armor hardness will be lowered so long as this effect is being applied, and it will enable your multi-cannons to do their full damage. I'm not sure off the top of my head how much corrosive shell lowers armor hardness, but the effect does get diminished a little bit when you get into these higher armor categories. It does, however, allow all of your other weapons to do that damage. Once corrosive shell is on, the base armor hardness is lowered, and every single tick of incoming damage that gets applied to that ship, whether or not it's from your ship, is going to, to damage the hull as if it had the lower rating. Now, this starts to make a, a, a big difference when you're attacking these larger ships but it's extremely helpful if you're flying a smaller ship and you don't get to have the advantage of large hardpoints since the only small ship to have a large hardpoint is the Vulture. So let's get in here and stick a multi-cannon. You'll see here that you, you take a substantial... One more 
your time here. Get multi cannon on. You take a reduction to piercing value for multi cannons on medium hard points. You go from 54 to 37, all the way down to 22. And that means that a size 1 multi cannon is only going to do its full normal damage to a hauler and a sidewinder without some type of modifier to take the armor hardness off the top. So a sidewinder actually faces a slight disadvantage um, in this scenario when it attacks an Imperial Eagle with a size 1 hard point because there's a full six points of armor differential. That's not too bad. It's You can overcome it. A sidewinder can definitely kill an Eagle. But the Eagle is going to have a resilience advantage against small hard points because its armor is thicker. And if you get up here to the the Cobra and the Viper, that advantage gets even wider. So having corrosive shell on small ships is really helpful to be able to, to tamp that that down and allow your it basically frees up all of your hard points to do their full damage. Again, with corrosive shell, only one hard point on your ship should have this effect. Because adding this effect to other hard points will have literally zero impact on your combat viability whatsoever. And if you're going to stick this on a hard point in your ship, I think it's better to stick corrosive shell on your lower damage and kinetics if available. So if you've got a size 1 multi-cannon and a size 2 multi-cannon, I would stick corrosive shell on your size 1 multi-cannon and then use one of the other on-offer experimentals. Let me stick this in here, overcharge. I can make a video going over which engineering effects are best, but I'm just focusing on corrosive shell now since it directly affects armor. But there is a whole litany of other effects that you can select for that change the way that the hard point can perform. <clears throat> now, piercing doesn't just apply to kinetics either. Let me clear this out. And I'm just going to alt click and we'll do pulse lasers. Pulse lasers actually maintain, let's see, pulse lasers piercing is, and this is true of energy weapons in general, they're going to have a slightly less piercing value than their kinetic counterpart. But that doesn't mean that they're a slash. That's a two point difference between the pulse laser and the multi cannon. This thing is still dangerous in combat, and even though it has the lowest DPS of the energy weapons, man, I, and I just made a video the other day talking about multi-cannons and pulse lasers have an, an excellent weapon synergy. And if you're still trying to figure the game out, these are like the bread and butter that everyone should start with. I fly fully engineered ships in this game that just have pulse lasers or burst lasers and multi-cannons. It's dangerous. Nobody's going to think you're a joke flying around using these weapons. They might not think you're the greatest player on Earth, but you're not the worst. So, <clears throat> this takes us from the non-engineering thing into what resistances do. And resistances are something that become extremely important, especially in high-level uh, PvP engagements, because they, they can make or break in a long-term engagement over time. So to understand how uh, armor resistances work, we need to look at the different types of armor and explain the way that damage is tabulated in Elite Dangerous, because there's multiple layers of calculations that get applied in a specific order, and that order really matters when you get down to it. So let me load up another example weapon here. We'll, we'll do a pulse laser, just because it's easy to explain. So when you fire on a target ship with this weapon, their first potential calculation that the game is going to make is based on falloff, which for pulse lasers is under half a kilometer. Now this means that any target at distances beyond this falloff distance of 0.5 kilometers is going to have its DPS slashed off the top before you even get to pierce the, the target ship's armor. And that falloff is going to escalate linearly until you hit 3 kilometers where it will do zero damage, it'll just be out of range. After your falloff, um, let's say you strike the shield of an oncoming target. Shields don't have armor hardness whatsoever. Shields are just shields. So when you target another ship and your weapons hit its shields, your falloff is going to be calculated, you'll strike the shield, and then the game will roll out the resistances. Now shield resistances are like shields are their own their own demon here, and I want to save them for a separate video because you'll the way you set up shields requires a completely different group of modules and equipment than what you'll use to set up armor. So we'll assume, for the purposes of our explanation, that, that the target you're firing on is unshielded. That you've already whittled the shields down and now you're damaging the hull. Falloff gets rolled, then piercing gets rolled, and then, after piercing is rolled, 
the remaining damage is filtered through the armor's resistances. Now, all resistances do is determine how much of the remaining DPS is actually applied to the hull. <coughs> uh, armor piercing, I should note too, uh, is used in the game's calculations to determine whether or not an, a weapon impact will pierce the hull and potentially damage internal modules. Energy and kinetic weapons can damage internal modules, but you have to be sub-targeting that module to, to be able to do that damage in effect. So <coughs> we'll, we'll go to sub-targeting. Actually, we'll save module sub-targeting for later, except to say that um, every hull strike that a weapon has has a chance to pierce the hull, and that chance increases as the target's hull gets weaker and weaker. It starts to get easier to sub-target internal modules. So, lightweight alloy. Um, every ship's core, every ship's core internal is going to have uh, an, a base armor lightweight alloy, and this lightweight alloy is going to have the intrinsic absolute armor integrity that is connected to the hull. I mentioned intrinsic traits earlier. You've got hull weight, hull hardness, absolute hull integrity. Reinforced alloy and military-grade composites are slightly improved versions of the armor that you already have. But these different versions of armor will add a certain amount of base integrity to your hull's absolute value. And that, that base integrity is derived from whatever your hull's base absolute strength is. So you've got 1,000 here. Add reinforced alloy. It gives you just under 500 more ticks of absolute hull. And then military-grade composite, which is pretty good gives you the maximum hull boost that armor will give you. And then these other two down here just flip the resistance table. So military grade composite has the, the base characteristic that all armor has with a massive explosive vulnerability, a significant kinetic vulnerability, and then neutral thermal damage. Now this is zero, 0 basically just means if a pulse laser hits the hull it'll do 14.8 damage. But with this minus 40 and minus 20, um, if I were to attack a hull with this resistance ratio with something like a multi-cannon. Fall off gets applied, piercing gets applied, and then whatever's left of this DPS gets times to by 0.4. So this says 18.9 DPS. In reality, it's probably going to be doing something in the mid-20s with an explosive resistance like this. It might even be doing close to 30. And this is, with before engineering came into the game, this was actually a big deal. Like, there wasn't much that you could do to overcome this. So having a balanced mixture of weapons on your ship was really important. You would use energy weapons to fry a target's shields, and then you would switch to kinetics and absolutely wreck their day. Um, with engineering, that has gone out the window, and now you basically have full control over the relative resistance of both shields and hull. We'll do shields in another video. I'm going to stick to what I'm doing here with hull. 90% of players who are building combat ships are going to opt for reactive surface composite. The, um, and that's for, for PvP and for general surface combat. If you're doing Thargoid combat, you can actually um, select military grade composite, which is slightly cheaper, because um, Thargoid weapons deal absolute damage and resistances don't matter. So the only thing you care about is just raw absolute value. But for our purposes, we'll do reactive surface composite which gives us the maximum hull boosting. You'll notice here that it's flipped the table, so now we have 40% thermal resistance hull, and our explosive and kinetic resistance is in the 20% range. From here, there are an array of engineering effects that you can select for, although most people doing PvP want to up their absolute hull resistance. So they'll go in here and select Heavy Duty because if in the list of available things that it alters, it increases your hull boost, which is the multiplier that gets tacked onto your ship's base hull integrity. And all that means in plain English is um, Heavy Duty gives you more hull. There we go, 2680. And then Deep Plating takes that 2680 and adds another multiplier on top of it to give us 2,894 absolute hull. And this is, like, this figure is really important, but you'll notice, too, over here in this table that it tells you your your theoretical hull integrity against the, difference da against the different damage types. So we've got 21.7% um, explosive. That means that if you're attacking a target with explosive damage, you need explosive weapons um, with the ammunition and DPS to be able to do 3,697 total damage. 
which is a lot. You, you would need a lot of missiles to make that one work. But you'll notice over here, because you've got a minus 37% thermal, um, this, is, this is referred to as a thermal resistance hole, as in hole in the ground. Uh, the, the game tells you that, that a target only needs weapons capable of doing 2,113 units of thermal damage to kill you. So if I know that somebody's got a huge thermal hole, I'm going to load my ship up with all energy weapons and fry their shields off as fast as I can with whatever's available, knowing full well that once I expose the underlying hull, that, that he's not going to survive. Um, caustic damage is Thargoid related, so just ignore that for now. It doesn't matter for most engagements in this game. So, when you're building a ship for general use combat in Elite Dangerous, and this is assuming you know, PvE, you want to hit you want to get all of your resistances up to around 30%. So you'll note here we've got this big thermal hole. There's a couple of ways you want to do this, but while you're doing it, you also want to get your absolute whole hull value as high as possible. So the way that you modify your hull's resistances in Elite Dangerous is by, you know, let me scoot this out of the way, going in and selecting hull reinforcement packages. The package, depending on its size, will add um, a different fixed amount of armor to your ship. So you know that the values now appear over 3,000. But what you stick on the different hull reinforcement packages is going to be affected by how big the package is and how much armor that it adds. So armor here is 390 for these 5D hull reinforcement packages, but the 2D hull reinforcement package only gives you 190. When you're trying to figure out your armor resistance mixtures, you'll want to make sure that your larger hull reinforcement packages are set up with heavy duty, deep plating, because that maximizes the amount of relative armor that is added. And the deep plating hull, um, heavy grade mixture is also going to give you just a flat increase to all of your available resistances across the board. And that's going to lower our thermal hull while also bolstering our kinetic and explosive uh, resistance that we already have. So these two together add about 1,400 total absolute hull to our ship. Explosive and kinetic resistance have gone up. And you'll notice that without doing anything else, we've almost, that we've more than filled in our thermal hull. Now it's got a 3.1% thermal resistance, where before it was a vulnerability. And the Coriolis has gone in and adjusted the thermal value automatically, as indicated. Now for your large, I've explained what you need to do with your large hull reinforcement packages. When you're playing with small hull reinforcement packages, this is where you go in and you really stick your finger on the scale in favor of something, because whether you, you modify a large hull reinforcement package or a small hull reinforcement package for a specific resistance, it's going to have the same effect on your resistance table. Um, so I'll go in, and on my 2D hull reinforcement package, I'm going to go grade 5 thermal resistant and reflective plating for maximum thermal resistance. And this is my individual choice. There are other commanders who will, who will suggest that you should go, no, go um, deep plating across the board. But that does have an effect on how your thermals play out. So you notice when I change this back to reflective plating, that the damage resistances have shifted accordingly. It's not a big shift, but if you're sticking a bunch of little hole reinforcement packages on, those little shifts can add up. And I tend to favor, uh, I tend to favor the resistance thing, just as my own personal opinion. But I'll leave that up to chef's choice or dealer's choice or whatever you want to call it. Now, with just three hull reinforcement packages, we've achieved our minimum end goal of at least 30% damage resistance across the board for a hull. And from this point out, we can basically just heavy duty all the rest of the hull reinforcement packages that we stick on this thing and, and do pretty well. And from, from here, this is where you, you basically play with it to your heart's content. And, and that's basically the only thing that I would recommend now. Um, the Type 10 gives you a lot of room to play with this, and you can easily get your absolute hole north of, of six grand. And some commanders I've seen really tweak this thing around. I think can get, I think the maximum you can possibly get is eight, and that's if you just 
fill everything in. I could play with that here, but this video is already almost a half an hour long, and I want to try to shave it down because I doubt that very many people will want to listen that long. But if you're going to bias your thermal resistances a certain direction, it's okay to have your thermal resistance be a little bit higher because the two favorite weapons in PvP in this game, uh, the plasma accelerator, which I'll bring up here, and the railgun, which is actually only available in a maximum of a medium hardpoint. These are interesting weapons in the game because you'll note that they both have a piercing value of 100, meaning that no matter what you attack in this game, you're, you're going to do maximum damage. This is why they're favored in PvP, because if you're just using plasma accelerators and railguns, you're not worried about corrosive shells. In fact, corrosive shells aren't even an option. In them. But um, this is in Coriolis it actually tells you the types of damage. Absolute damage is a real kick in the ghoulies. It completely bypasses all of your resistances and it attacks this figure directly, whereas the kinetic and thermal damage that plasma accelerators can inflict is filtered through this lens before it's applied to this number. Railguns, however, uh, they only do, they do mostly thermal and just a touch of kinetic. And they're going to get applied to this too, but, but the bulk of the damage that a railgun does is thermal. So um, since these two weapons are favored and they're, they both have a significant chunk of their damage as thermal, you want to make sure that your thermal, if you can, is just a little bit higher than your kinetic. It's not a bad thing. It's also not too terrible if they're balanced, but um, this higher thermal resistance will give you a little bit more time to breathe if your shields go down and your hull tanking. Um, I should note that hull tanks are not very common in the current meta. I'm hoping that um, FDev will come in and change this because hull damage is forever. Shields regenerate relatively easily. Once you start taking hull damage, it's it's basically a war of attrition at that point. The bigger numbers win. Um, Module sub-targeting can shake that up a little bit, but as a general rule, you want to kill an enemy ship, you gotta, you got to take this number down to zero. Um, <coughs> so that's some of the basics of armor in Elite Dangerous. I hope that's helpful to everybody, and uh, I'll talk to you all later.